everybody, welcome back. So we're reading the sealed nectar. Nectar is sealed. Sealed nectar. Okay. Alright. We have read quite a bit of it. Look at that. Alright. This paragraph is titled The Assassination of Asuldula, the Lion of Allah, Hamza bin Abdul Mutalib. Hamza's assassin, Wahsi bin Harb. Okay, that's the dude who murked him. Described how he killed Hamza. He said, I was a slave working for Jubair bin Mutim, whose paternal uncle, Tuama bin Adi, was injured at the Battle of Badr. So when the Quraysh marched to Uhud, Jubair said to me, If you kill Hamza, the uncle of Muhammad, stealthily, you shall be manumitted. So I marched with the people to Uhud. And I am an Asib Abyssinian man who is an expert with the Abyssinian spear. So when the two parties fought, I set out seeking Hamza. I saw him amidst people fighting. He was like a white and black striped camel, striking severely with his sword and no one could stand in his way. By Allah, when I was getting ready and trying to seize the fit opportunity to spear him, dang, can you imagine what it feel like to get straight speared? And then, ugh. Hiding sometimes behind a tree or a rock, hoping that he might draw nearer and be within range. At that moment, I caught sight of Siba bin Abdul Uzza going closer towards him. When Hamza observed him, he said, Come on, O son of the clitoris cutter. For his, ew, for his mother used to be a circumciser. Oh, then he struck one strong stroke that could hardly miss his head. Then I balanced my spear and shook it till I was content with it. Then I speared him, and it went down into his stomach and issued out between his legs. So, going down and, oh, the pain. He attempted moving towards me, but he was overcome by his wound. I left him there with the spear in his entrails till he died. Then I came to him, pulled out my spear, and returned to the place of the camp. Just, I stayed there and I did not go out, for he was the only one I sought. I killed him only to free myself, so as soon as I got back to Mecca, I became a free man. So him doing that allowed him to get his freedom? Bringing the situation under control. Although the death of Asdula, Lion of Allah, and his messenger, peace be upon him, Hamza bin Abdul Mutalib, was a great loss, the Muslims maintained full control over the whole situation on the battlefield. On that day, Abu Bakr, Umar bin al Khattab, Ali bin Abi Talib, Az Zubair bin al Awam, Musab bin Umar, Talha bin Abdullah, Abdullah bin Jash, Sa'ad bin Arbi, and Anas bin Anadar, and others, all of them fought so fiercely, effectively and efficiently, that they broke the strong will of the idolaters and scattered them. From his wife's lap to sword fights and sorrows. One of the brave adventures of that day was Hanzala al-Ghasil. Hanzala, that's a cool. He was Hanzala bin Abdu Abu Amir. Abu Amir was the very monk that was nicknamed Al Fasik, evildoer, dissolute, which was mentioned earlier. Hanzala, who was newly married, left his wife's bed for Al Jihad, fight in the cause of Allah. He set out the moment he heard the call to Al Jihad. When he faced the idolaters on the battlefield, he made his way through their ranks till he reached their leader, Abu Sufyan Sakhar bin Harb, and nearly killed him. But he had been ordained to be a martyr, so at that very moment, Shadad bin al Aswad reached him and killed him. So you have Abu Sufyan Sakhar bin Harb, Shadad. All right. He was an evildoer. Hmm. The contribution of the squad of archers to the battle. The squad of archers, whom Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, positioned on the archer's mountain, had the upper hand in administering the war activities to go in favor of the Muslim army. 
the Meccan horsemen commanded by Khalid bin al-Walid, supported by Abu Amr al-Fasik, made three attacks against the left wing of the Muslim army with the aim of crushing it, and then infiltrating into the rear to create a sort of confusion and disorder. And notice how Muhammad, peace with him, wanted to make sure that the rear was guarded, and then notice how the people who want to keep attacking the Muslims, they keep attacking the rear. in the ranks of the Muslims and subsequently inflict heavy defeat on them. But thanks to the skills, quickness, and the great efforts of the archers, the three assaults were countered successfully. Yeah, archers are great, aren't they? The idolaters began to sense defeat. The battles went on and fiercely with it the Muslims in full command of the military theater until the idolaters found scattered and retreated, leaving all motives of pride and forgetting their affected dignity with their standard trodden under the feet of the fighters, with none ever courageous enough to approach it. It seemed as if the 3,000 idolaters had been fighting 30,000 Muslims and not merely several hundred. So they forgot the, the standard trodden under the feet of the fighters. So the standard has fallen. Ibn Ishaq said, then Allah sent down his help to the Muslims and verified his promise to them. They chased the idolaters and evacuated them from their camp. No doubt it was a certain defeat. Abdullah bin Az-Zubair narrated that his father said, By Allah, I was watching the servants of Hind bin Utba and her women friends, fleeing with their garments gathered up. No one was there to prevent us from capturing them. In another version, Al-Bara bin Nazib mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. Oh, everybody mentions Bukhari. Everybody mentions him. He said, when we fought them, they fled and their women could be seen fleeing in the mountains with their ankles and legs exposed. Oh, because they're picking up and they want to run, right? The Muslims pursued the enemies, putting them to the sword and collecting the spoils. The Archer's Fatal Mistake While the small army of Islam was recording the second absolute and clear victory over the Makkans, which was no less in splendor and glory than the first one at Badr, the majority of the archers on the mountainside committed a fatal mistake that turned the whole situation upside down and constituted a source of heavy losses among the Muslims. It has almost brought about the murder of the Prophet, peace be with him, and left a very bad impression on the fame and dignity they deserved earned at the Battle of Badr. We have already spoken about the positive orders given to the archers to hold on to their position, whatever the course the battle adopts. In spite of those strict orders and their leaders, Abdullah bin Jubair, warning 40 archers deserted their post, enticed by the too soon roar of victory. Ooh, that's a lot of people who deserted their post. As well as worldly greed for the spoils of war. Ah, so they abandoned their post because they wanted to get some of that merch. The others, however, nine in number and Abdullah, their leader, decided to abide by the Prophet's order and stay where they were until they were given leave or killed to the last. Consequently, the rear of the Muslim army was left inadequately defended. Again, the rear. Again, the rear. Khalid bin al-Walid cuts off the rear. Again, the rear. <laughs> we're learning something. The sharp-minded Khalid bin al-Walid seized the opportunity to turn swiftly around to the rear of the Muslim army and encompass them, killing Ibn Jubair and his group. They fell promptly upon the rear of the Muslims and his horsemen uttered a shout that signaled the new military developments. The polytheists returned once again to counterattack the Muslims. An idolater woman called Umrah bint al ahmar al-Harithiyah rushed to the standard lying on the earth, picked it up, and raised it. The idolaters gathered together around the standard and called un out unto one another till they encircled the Muslims and stood fast to fight again. Oh, a woman did that. She, she went in and grabbed their standard and, you know, raised it, and then they flocked to her. The Muslims consequently became trapped between two barriers. Oh, a pincer move? Maybe Allah's messenger, peace be with him, was then among a small group of fighters, nine in number at the rear, 
of the army watching the battle and braving the Muslim fighters. Khalid and his men took him by utter surprise and obliged him to follow either of the two options. One, to flee for his life and abandon his army to its doom and Khalid and his men took him obliged. So they're trying, he's trying to encourage the Muslims this, watching the battle and braving the Muslim fighters, Khalid. And his men took him by utter surprise. Okay, one, to flee for his life and abandon his army to its doom end. You have no honor if you do that, right? Two, to take action at the risk of his life, rally the ranks of the Muslims again, and work their way through the hills of Uhud toward the encompassed army. The genius of Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, his peerless and matchless courage, made him opt for the second course. He raised his voice, calling out unto his companions, O oh, servants of Allah, he did that though he knew that his loud voice would be heard by idolaters before it was heard by the Muslims. He called out unto them, risking his life in this delicate situation. The idolaters recognized him and reached his position even before the other Muslims could do so. Oh, he revealed his position. Oh, that's scary. All right, fam. 